All of the content in this video is protected by the Copyright Act of 1976. This is the most hated comedian in the industry. Not Joe Rogan, his buddy. Brendan Schaub. Brendan is a 39-year-old ex-football player, ex-UFC fighter turned podcaster and stand-up comedian. The combination of multiple concussions and speaking on podcasts for a living leads to a lot of misspeaking, terrible opinions, bad jokes, harassment, but also fame and fortune. Brendan worked his whole life to be an athlete, be a fighter, but there's no doubt he got a shortcut to being a comedian. Turns out this shortcut has made for some very interesting controversy, shocking accusations, and deep internet lore that thousands of people actively contribute to daily. Today we are going to deep dive into the controversial rise of Brendan Schaub. Brendan has a history of false copywriting YouTube videos criticizing him. Brendan, if you're watching this, don't illegally take down my video. Just drink some water. There's an old saying, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. It turns out Brennan Schaub knows someone very popular, Joe Rogan. For the very few unaware, Rogan is the voice of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. He has been the lead commentary panelist at the UFC since 2002. Brennan Schaub signed with the UFC in 2009 after an impressive 4-0 semi-pro record and heavyweight championship victory in the Ring of Fire MMA League. Before he was a fighter, he was a fullback for the University of Colorado. He went undrafted in the 2006 NFL Draft, then signed to two different arena football league teams but never played a single game. I guess he was a better fighter than a ball player. In his UFC debut, he got his light shut off by 260 pound heavyweight Roy Nelson. After that, Brennan would go on to have an okay UFC career. After four straight victories via TKO, Brendan Big Brown Schaub was looking like the future heavyweight star the UFC needed. In 2011, he beat his idol, Mirko Krokop. However, he got beat up so badly in this fight despite winning that he knew the UFC wasn't his passion anymore, which led to his demise in the ring. Schaub lost four out of his next six fights. His last loss was so bad that Joe Rogan actually convinced him to quit. There's a bridge between you and the very best guys in the world. And I don't know if you can cross that bridge. May of 2014, Rogan was already a five-year veteran in the podcast world. His show is quite literally still the same now as it was then. He started a new segment called Fight Companion, where he would get a few of his buddies and watch the UFC fights while recording their reactions and conversations. The UFC only hires Joe to commentate on high-profile matches, but he loves watching fights because he's a fan before an employee. Schaub was the perfect guest for this series because he was a fighter. He knows a lot about the sport, he knows the mentality of a fighter before the event, during the event, and after. He knows how it feels to knock someone out, to be on top of the world, to be knocked out, and be humiliated. On top of that, he knew some of the fighters personally and could provide even more insight. Brendan became a regular. The JRE community became fans of Brendan's company. They were excited for his upcoming fights, even though they knew he was past his prime. But after his loss against Travis Brown in December 2014, Joe had to speak up. The reality of your skill set, where are you at now, I don't see you beating the elite guys. There's a fluidity to their movement that you don't really have. There's shit that other people can do that you can't do. If you had a wrestling match with Cain Velasquez, how well do you think you'd do? I think people would be surprised. Really? Mm -hmm. You think so? Mm -hmm. I think you'd be surprised. Mm. I really do. I think he'd you up. The issue is, can you become a champion? If you can't become a champion, are you comfortable with getting knocked out three or four more times over the next five or six years. Mm. Brendan didn't agree with Joe at the moment. He wasn't ready to accept the fact that he was not a high-level fighter. But Joe and his good friend Brian Callen were trying to convince him that he had other career options. Whether or not you agree with, it, with that, what I care about is the fact that you have a future in other things and you're really good at. Like, you're really funny. He uh, say funny shit, dude, dude. he says, he comes up with every one of the fucking memes, you know, it's ridiculous. You say funny shit. Man. Yeah, you do. You have a ridiculous talent for that. When you have two professional comedians telling you that you are funny, that maybe you should pursue a career in stand-up, that's a good sign. Brendan already had a successful sports slash comedy show alongside Brian Callen that was hosted and produced by Fox, The Fighter and the Kid. With hundreds of thousands of people he was reaching online, it was clear that Brendan had a brighter future outside of the ring. All professional fighters have to face the ego-shattering decision to put down the gloves one day. You have to live with people calling you scared, a quitter, a pussy, even though they themselves would never step into the ring with another person. Luckily for Brendan, he turned it into a financial decision. Reebok signed an exclusive uniform deal with the UFC where fighters couldn't wear any other brand during the fight. Not a sponsored brand, not their favorite brand, not even their own brand. Some fighters would get as low as $2,500 per fight to wear Reebok gear. Higher profile fighters would get around $10,000 per fight to wear Reebok. 
I've made six figures in sponsorship in each of my last six fights. The 90% pay cut Brandon would have to take on top of the inevitable knockouts and concussions he would receive by continuing a fighting career just didn't make sense. It took about 10 months to make it official, but in the 706th episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, he finally took Joe's advice and officially retired from MMA. I gotta step away from the game, man. I gotta step away from the UFC for right now. He pursued a stand-up career, opening and doing small sets for his co-star Brian Callen. In 2016, he debuted his first solo performance at the Comedy Store in LA. The fighter and the kid had a falling out with Fox Sports for their show. The network wanted 50% of all the revenue earned on the show. They wanted to remove Brian Callen and make creative changes including the notion that they should stop cursing. Obviously, that wasn't going to work, so they decided to go independent. So we just decided to go our separate ways. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that Brendan funded the new studio, purchased all the cameras and equipment, since podcasting was about to be his new career, whereas Brian had a stand-up comedy and acting career in full effect. With all this new free time and equipment, Brendan launched his own solo podcast called The Big Brown Breakdown, where he would mostly talk about MMA-related news with a guest. He was constantly on the Joe Rogan podcast, which was exploding to new heights. He was getting comedy spots next to 10, 15, 20-year veterans in the industry. He got a spot on Showtime, commentating and analyzing the massive Floyd Mayweather vs. Conor McGregor fight. By mid-2017, he was doing solo stand-up tours. He already had a fan base from his podcast and affiliation with other comics, so he was doing shows with big crowds of people before ever proving himself as a funny comedian. His fame was reaching all-time highs. Brendan Schaub was the meathead best friend. That's kind of dumb. Definitely has CTE. Hey, photographers, you blockbuster. <laughs> they were talking about fraternity? Fratur fraternity? Fraternity? Fr uh, fraternal. But seems like a good guy. He didn't really add much to the conversation. Got a, a dicey past in terms of the law. Some would say the diciest. A, a rough reason for why. The know. roughest. Oh. Who knows? It's fun. It's so. Oh, it's the funnest. Yeah, it is fun. It's the best. You feel like this is a dirty business. Like, I don't want to be a part of your dirty business. It's the business. dirtiest business. Dirt but he was officially living his lifelong dream of becoming a comedian. And my dream was to be a comedian. My heroes were Jim Carrey and Adam Sandler growing up. Which a lot of people say is just him trying to convince himself that he belongs in this space. However... When the rise to fame comes so quickly, there are bound to be some negatives. He was making some enemies online. In October of 2017, someone posted this on the Joe Rogan subreddit, a compilation of insufferable Brendan clips titled, This is why nobody likes Brendan Schaub. The comment section formed a small community of people sharing their disdain for him. He started another podcast called The King and the Sting with Theo Vaughn, who is charming, likable, and a hilarious comedian. By the end of 2018, he owned and produced three very successful podcasts, was selling merch like crazy, friends with some of the biggest names in comedy after just two years. He released his first stand-up special on Showtime called You'd Be Surprised, and a lot of people were surprised at how unfunny he was. It's out the biggest syringe you've ever seen in your life, like he's out of a goddamn comic book, goes, Mr. Shab, I have to numb your lip. You need many, many stitches. This be worth paying your life, guaranteed. Worth paying your life. Clearly, Jamal's a black dude. <laughs> Gives a mean ass haircut. This is gonna go well. I don't discriminate. This is gonna be sick. Let's do it, Jamal. This dude comes out of the bathroom. He's all, "What's up, man? I'm Jamal." He was Asian as shit. <laughs> His buddy Rogan even thought it was bad. The first one, I would have probably tried to talk you out of it, but I already talked you out of fighting. Yeah. And I was like, I can't talk him out of this, too. Rogan admitting years later that he should have talked Brandon out of doing this special, but didn't, kind of tells you all you need to know. I'm not the comedy police. I'm not going to tell you what's funny and what isn't. So through the clips in this video or on your own time, you can decide whether he's funny or not. However, filming a special is a big moment for a comedian's career. Most comedians are hustling clubs and working on material for a decade before ever releasing something permanent. Every artist makes a bad song, every painter has a bad piece, every comedian has a bad joke. It takes years and years to perfect a craft. Not even perfect, but just make something really solid. By comparison, Tom Segura started doing comedy around 2001 after graduating college. He did his first televised set in 2007 on Comedy Central and didn't film a special until 20. 2010, nine years after starting. Bill Burr started comedy in 1992, recorded his first special in 2003, 11 years later. Kevin Hart started comedy in college around 2000-2001. 
2000, didn't film his first special until 2009, nine years after starting. Brendan filmed his special just two years after starting comedy. He could have just done his tours and made those fans happy who were purchasing tickets to see him live. But once you put out a special, you are going to be subject to criticism, and he was not ready for that. He bribed his fans for reviews of his special. Today through the end of the week, if you follow the link below and leave the kind of review Brendan deserves for You'd Be Surprised, you will receive a one-time coupon for 50% off your entire Pure Spectrum order. They left reviews, all right. 1.5 out of 10 stars was the average rating of his special. Now he had to discount his CBD oil to a bunch of people that hated his work. You could argue, okay, it's just a bunch of people hating on him, trolling, and being overly harsh because he's popular. I mean, that's definitely what Brendan thinks. If it's a hater, if it's, you know, a YouTuber talking shit, you can do that. You can criticize my comedy. A lion doesn't care what the sheep say. These people are just sheeps. You know, it's just this sheep mentality. It's this loser mentality. Other than a few rude comments, this was the first backlash Brendan really got. His comedian friends gassed him up, told him he was hilarious, and that stand-up was his future. But the fans saw him differently. It got even worse. The Fighter and the Kids subreddit was once a place for people to come and discuss all things comedy and sports. It became the community center to troll Shab. All the popular posts were videos of him slurring his words, interrupting people, lying, telling bad jokes. It got so deep with inside jokes that they had to get organized. They created an extensive and extremely impressive archive of the history of how the forum was created. They defined his idiotic ideals as Shabisms, which is something that Brendan Shab says often that doesn't make any sense, yet he continues to say it. If this is a big fight stew, company stew, I should say this big vat of stew. I want that soup. I want that big ass stew. The this, this ships are too sailing in the night. He interrupted people, told obvious lies, couldn't speak properly, and made a bunch of bad jokes and often had terrible takes. You, you realize, like, that's not sustainable. I don't know if but that a ever sweet goes potato, away. You know, the, you're like learning how to. I don't know if people. it ever goes away. I always have it. It's just controlling the monster. For me, especially coming to comedy, not everyone was nice to me, man. And then what is the thing that surprised you the most about doing stand up that you didn't expect? I would say how nice everybody is. When I trained, trained, or when I uh, trained with, ask me how I'm doing. How are you doing, man? I'm chill like a turkey after Thanksgiving. We get it, UFC tonight, Fox. You're not racist. We get it. You have an oh. all-black panel. We get. Whoa, we get it. The community called themselves homeless cats because Brendan views internet trolls as being worthless, like homeless people or cats. The people that are are negative or are on. Uh, I, are, are on forums and are uh, create troll accounts. I, I view those people the same I'd view a homeless guy critiquing my art or critiquing my set or critiquing a podcast. They do not matter. They even type their comments in Shabanese, which is the variation of the English language spoken by Brendan Schaub. Brendan claimed he didn't care about the people who hated on him, that they were just miserable people who were jealous of his success. You guys know me. I don't really, um, I don't really engage with haters. And while some of that may be true, it's very obvious he did care. I know I look like this stuff doesn't bother me. It hurts my feelings, man. It always has. Some people agree with Shab that the Reddit users are just people obsessed with bullying him. Some people say Brendan is a bully himself. I uh, threatened to beat up a guy at a coffee shop. And he can't handle when someone does it back to him. He no, that's DeSantis 2024. You eating, a, you eating a donut or are you eating cheese? Well, whatever it is, you sound exactly the same as you do when you don't have that in your mouth. <laughs> Come on, Chris. <laughs> Chris, sorry. Chris, Chris, man, don't. He's sensitive about his. But no, it's okay, but we gotta rib each other. Others really don't care about Shab specifically. They just like the community aspect. Memes and harmless trolling that comes with the Fighter and the Kid subreddit. It got better for a little bit. The King and the Sting podcast became a saving grace for Brendan. Him and Theo were a good pair, mostly because they would just make fun of each other and lean into their own stupidity. You look like fucking Wyatt Slurp, bro. You look like a cop at a freaking bathhouse, dude. dude you, yeah. you look like a DJ at a rave, fucking dip slow. Plus, Theo is so charming, fans could listen to him talk to anyone, including just a random plumber. Just happy to talk to a plumber, man, because I don't know anything really about plumbing. I right, ask away. But then came the downfall of the Fighter and the Kid podcast. It actually started with their good friend and fellow comedian Chris D'Elia. D'Elia had multiple public accusations of sexual assault and grooming underage girls in June of 2020, which consisted of him texting, flirting, trying to meet up with and potentially be intimate with women who were under the age of 18. He claimed that everything he did was legal and consensual. Everything I've done has been legal and consensual, and that's true. But social media, his comedy peers, and business partners did not agree with his actions morally, even if he wasn't technically 
technically being tried for a crime. They publicly denounced him and cut all ties with him. This was Brian and Brendan's reaction. I have never seen or heard of him doing anything illegal. I don't know what to think and I don't know what to say. I'm as shocked as anyone. I'm hurt. I'm mad. I'm, I'm f***ing mad, man. I'm mad at him. Okay. okay. After this, they moved on and continued just like nothing ever happened. But Delia fans were angry at the two. Bring Chris back with an epic podcast. You owe him that for the many times he's helped you guys. Those three were known for having great chemistry together. Well, more so Brian and Chris. Half of their most popular episodes featured Chris. So Delia fans felt that he was innocent and was a victim of cancel culture. And that these two should be his saving grace if they were his real friends. But it got worse. Brian Callen, just one month later, was accused of, R-wording, a former Mad TV cast member. Once the victim came out, three other women shared their allegations against Callen, which included him groping, having affairs with, and soliciting sex for stage time. This is me saying that I categorically and absolutely deny all the allegations against me. Brendan didn't stop the podcast, not even for one week. He just kept bringing guest after guest. Every week, you didn't know who was going to be on. He dropped Brian and never talked about it, just said he was on vacation. Granted, if the allegations were true, nobody would blame Brendan. The fans still felt betrayed. They said Callan was the whole reason Brendan had a podcast career, and they simply dealt with Brendan just to listen to Brian. Brendan got a new set, new co-stars, and never addressed anything. This comment section can't be disregarded. We want Brian back. Brian didn't make an appearance on the show until six months after the allegations. When he came back, views shot up. However, it was only temporary. He didn't become a consistent member of the podcast until a full year later but it gets worse. Shab would get into some juicy drama that was picked up by tabloids and YouTube channels outside of the comedy world. A situation that elevated all of this Shab lore. The subreddit exploded, Shab got even more famous, and the general YouTube viewer base started to dive deeper into this comedy podcast world. The situation involves Brendan, fellow comedian Bobby Lee, that he claims to be good friends with, and Bobby's wife, Kalila. Brendan, who is a married man with two kids, allegedly tried to make sexual passes at Kalila. January 25th, on an episode of the Trash Tuesday podcast, hosted by Kalila Kuhn, Annie Letterman, and Esther Pavitsky, Kalila tells a story about a nameless comic who is unfunny that hit on her years ago. Annie adds that this same person asked her to walk him to his truck, and in her words, To what? Suck your dick like- And yes, of course, the Reddit turned truck walk into a meme. Walk me to my truck that- Truck walk. Can't talk. But I'm walking to my truck, can I get a truck walk? Yeah. The girls never mentioned his name, but they dropped some hints. Enough hints that the commenters were suspicious. The married comedian that hit on them is undoubtedly Brendan Schaub. Schaub claims he doesn't use social media. However, he heard about this situation. The next month, he allegedly texted Bobby and made a threat to him saying things like, I'm finally going after anyone who harasses me online. I have spent half a million dollars on lawyers. At this point, Schaub was getting a lot of heat for this online and was allegedly threatening Bobby and Kalila privately, saying, I don't want to have to get nasty with her, but if I have no choice, I can def play that game. Bobby and Shab had made an agreement that Kalila would no longer be talking about him and that he needed to let it go. Following this on another Trash Tuesday podcast, the girls had mentioned someone was trying to sue them, again alluding to Shab without saying his name, which fueled more hate directed towards Brandon online. Now we are in late April. Shab and Callan call Bobby to threaten him, saying that they have information that will end his career, and they accused him of being the mastermind behind all of the Reddit hate over the last six years. Bobby felt very threatened by this. He told Kalila what had happened. Kalila asked Bobby for Shab's phone number, and now we have the first direct communication between Kalila and Shab. Brendan had told Kalila that he has a team of private investigators looking into a video of child abuse on the subreddit Apparently, the investigators had found a barrage of comments coming from one IP address that could be tracked back to a computer in Bobby and Kalila's home. These investigators also allegedly had 300 pages of evidence that would prove that either Bobby or Kalila was responsible for the six years of hate directed at Shab and his family on Reddit. This conversation between the two was apparently very heated. They both described it as, The first time we talked was not really a talk. 
It was more like 10 minutes of screaming. Yes. Shab was under the impression that they had used his name in the original Trash Tuesday podcast. What's hilarious about this situation is Brendan allegedly hired private investigators and spent half a million dollars on lawyers without ever actually watching the original Trash Tuesday clip. Once he finally watched it, he called Kalila to apologize. The second conversation was much more productive after he realized they never said his name. Again, they both agreed to not speak about the situation publicly. There's a lot of he said, she said going on. Apparently Shab was slandering her name to Joe Rogan and Andrew Schultz, in which he denies. So Kalila decided their agreement to not talk about each other was off. We promised that this would never be brought up again, but then he went on flagrant two and talked about it, so I was like, all right, uh -huh. deal's off. Following this, Bobby and Kalila go on the H3H3 podcast to talk about the situation very bluntly, despite Bobby not wanting to. Ethan and Kalila were not very kind to Brandon on this podcast. Uh -huh. Brandon Schwab can't even read, bro. How the fuck that guy bringing 300 pages of anything? <laughs> Following this, they all decide to put the situation to rest and go on the Tiger Belly podcast to discuss. Getting to a place where we can move forward from it, right? Yeah, I don't a think and and the situation does maybe kind of seem like superficial drama, but like I said before, this was like massive news for the past few months. So now Shab's career is in a weird spot. He was liked in the beginning, got all the cosigns from the biggest comedians in the world. He basically had a wide open layup. All he had to do was just keep riding the wave. After the rough reception of his first special and he got dragged through the mud, you'd like to think that there would be some improvement. But the general consensus is that his second special, Gringo Poppy, was worse, earning him a shocking 1.1 star review. His plan was to produce the special himself through his Thick Boy network and then sell it to a major network. But it seems no networks were interested because you can now watch it in its entirety on the Thick Boy YouTube channel. He still has his successful show, Food Truck Diaries, which was originally produced by Showtime, but is now made by his own Thick Boy Network. Brendan will casually interview some of the biggest names in combat sports about their careers, past fights, and their future aspirations. The fight talk is always punctuated with a stop at a food truck to get something to eat, which always looks delicious by the way, and back into fighting after a quick lunch. He also has his Tiger Thick Whiskey brand, that seems promising, despite having a terrible name, Today, Shab has been canceling a lot of his stand-up shows, often canceling them with no real explanation or with a strange explanation. Now that we're rescheduled in San Francisco due to the crime wave. A lot of people online are speculating it's because he's not selling enough tickets, which is certainly not far-fetched considering the reception of his specials. Comedians are speaking out against him. Right. If I was like his friend, I'd be like, I don't know, I don't know if that's Is that ready. ready? Yeah, that's all. I, mean, I wasn't ready. Brendan Schaub used to be a, a MMA fighter, and now he's on Joe Rogan. Yeah, this nigga is awful. He was awful in MMA, and he is awful at stand-up comedy. This nigga is terrible. The Schaub trolling is at an all-time high. So is this really just an innocent man who was coerced into comedy by his famous best friend and now a victim of bullying? Or is he a full-blown narcissist doing anything he can to further his own agenda, get next to anyone with power or fame, and once they are no longer useful to him, he moves on? I guess that's for you to decide.